Hello, this is Llewellyn King for MECFS Alert. Today we are in Bethesda, Maryland, close to the National Institutes of Health, and it is my great pleasure to bring this conversation round to a discussion with Sadie Whitaker, who is the chief... What are you, Sadie? <laughs> Well, the, the, chief the chief scientific officer at a Solve, Solve ME, ME, CFS uh, ME CFS. Yeah. And what does what do you do? How does that work? So I head up the research initiatives at the organisation. Solve as an organisation has two main pillars. One is advocacy, um, and one is research. So I head up the research initiatives. And within that, we have two main areas of focus. One is to bring new researchers into the field keep them engaged and provide them with support to, pr to generate enough data to apply for bigger grants. And then the second focus is the registry and biobank. So trying to generate data uh, from patients to enable us to really get a better understanding of the disease. Now you're not a medical doctor but you're a, you're a, you're a, a, a specialist in biology? My PhD is in uh, molecular biology. Okay mm -hmm. and so this brings a fresh mind, in a sense, to looking at some of these things. Yeah, I mean, I think what I, I bring that's fresh to, to this field, I spent most of my career in pharma and biotech in clinical development. So absolutely, you know, in clinical trials, in patients, uh, in that setting. And so I, I, I think I bring to the organization a bit more of that translational thinking. Um, how can we move beyond bench research and, and try and start to understand you know what treatments are working for people why how do we get farmer engaged in this problem um, and how do we use big data and pharma we're talking about the pharmaceutical industry mm -hmm. the people who make medicines yeah and they've been a bit slow haven't they they yeah, haven't rushed sure. in to make medicines to deal with ME mm -hmm. they make medicines to deal with all sorts of things mm -hmm. is this because it's too difficult or they don't think there's enough money in it or they just haven't been inspired? I would say it's it's challenging, right? We There's lots of different um, subtypes. There's lots of different, seems like there's lots of different causes. Um, there's no clear molecular pathway. Um, so there's lots of questions around what you would need to create in terms of a drug to interrupt the course of the disease. So I think that's one issue for sure. I think there's also a lack of awareness uh, we know there's a lack of awareness in general, right, in the, among the general public, among clinicians, and probably ar among most people who work in that industry. So I also think there's an awareness problem. It, the pharmaceutical industry says it can cost up to two billion dollars. Mm -hmm. I think the website says 1.2 or 1.3 mm -hmm. yeah. to bring a new drug to market. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's terrifying. Mm -hmm. uh, and that may be why they're very loath if they can't identify the disease, if mm. there's no biomarker. That may be part of this problem. I don't know if that is the problem, to be honest with you, because clinical development happens in stages. So you don't decide that you're going to develop a medicine and then you have to lay down $1.2 billion. No, no, you, no. You, you know, it's very gated. And so your investment is very small in the beginning as you begin to understand the, the problem in animals and, and healthy volunteers and you grow it and grow it and grow it. It's really only when you get far down the road into these big phase three studies that the bulk of the cost happens. So I don't think that, I think the reason that they, they're not engaged is not to do with, um, the cost, it's an awareness problem and it's the comp complexity of the problem and a lack of understanding about molecular mechanisms. There are people who think that there should be a, 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 a trial now mm -hmm. uh, to get a handle on all of these different things, that there should be a clinical trial, take a cohort, mm -hmm. follow them, etc., form a new database mm -hmm. that way. How, what do you feel about that? I think, I think big data, so we're in the era of big data right now, mm -hmm. and uh, most of my experience is in the oncology setting, and big data has revolutionized how we look at that disease, right? It, it went from being breast cancer was a single homogeneous disease, now we know that it's 50 different diseases, mm -hmm. and that's really because of big data, right? You get enough information biological information from specimens, information about symptoms, you get enough information together, you're able to look at it and say, oh, actually, we've got a pocket here that looks like it's one thing, and another one over here, another one over here, another one over here, and you can start to 
piece together what might work for some people, why it doesn't work for everybody, why some people have the same, are exposed to the same things and don't get this disease. So I really believe that the answer There are a lot of data. it in the years that I've been doing this and writing about it and taking an interest. Some of the original questions are still unanswered. Mm -hmm. Why are there times when it appears infectious, mm -hmm. like in Klein Village, mm -hmm. uh, and mostly it's individual? doesn't seem to be a lot of person-to-person -person infection, transmission. But, mm -hmm. transmission, but sometimes in a family there is, mm -hmm. which suggests uh, genetic predisposition, mm -hmm. but doesn't establish mm -hmm. that absolutely. And mm -hmm. um, uh, what are your own thoughts about that? I mean, why do we have these clusters that, you know, going back to the Royal Free Hospital in 1955 in mm -hmm. England, uh, we have these huge clusters, and that seems to be uh, contrary to most of what we know about it, that it's an individual disease. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think it, it's so interesting, right, to your point, that, that you get these clusters which are related to, seem like they're related to infection or mm -hmm. a, an environmental event. I, honestly, I have no idea. It's, it, it's, it's very perplexing. Very perplexing I mean, it's a true scientific curiosity. Mm -hmm. You know, there definitely are clusters or were clusters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in very different environments. The mm -hmm. one in upstate New York, the environment, the socioeconomic uh, condition of the people, etc., is about as different from Nevada as you can get. Yeah. And within a year, we had two outbreaks. Yeah. I, I find that both frightening and interesting. I uh, think it's fascinating, and I don't know how much, I'm sure there's been a fair amount of research into to looking at, you know, why and what caused them, and but I, I I do find it fascinating. Do you have any feelings about any of the the triggers or the, what seem to be triggers that people think are triggers? Some cases exercise mold, which is often mm -hmm. identified as a, uh, a stimulant to this disease. What are your feelings about mold? Specifically, I mean, it's as a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as something to be avoided if you have this disease, or mm -hmm. what is its role? I mean, it's, it's very clear, right, that, that it has a, a very um, negative impact on, on people's health in general. And it's clear that it has a, a direct impact on, um, on this disease. But you don't think it's a cause? I mean, I, th I think there's multiple causes, right? And there's lots of theories out there mm -hmm. about this. But it seems like there is some kind of attack on your immune system, whether that's caused by mold, a virus, high periods of, um, of stress over a long duration, something pushes you into the How state. are we going to find out? There are a lot of compounds, a lot of drugs, mm -hmm. tens of thousands of them developed over the years. Mm -hmm. Many of them, their full potential in medicine is not known because mm -hmm. they were developed for a specific problem, a specific disease. Mm -hmm. And we find, say, with Rituxan B, that mm -hmm. there may be an off-label uh, use. Mm -hmm. um, do you think we should have as a general national project or international project, some mechanism of examining these these compounds to see how they might affect people with ME. Do you mean compounds that are already being used yeah, kind of in well, case studies or yeah, just in general across the board? That have been developed and been used for something. Yeah. I mean, again, right, I think it speaks to big data. If you could collect information on individual case studies and start to aggregate that data and say what are the characteristics of a patient who responds to rituxan? What are the characteristics of a patient who responds to Amplogen. Yeah, Amplogen is another example. You may start to see some patterns um, and I think people are starting to do that in some of these studies of these um, off-label drugs that are being used but the more information that we can get and the more people we can persuade to submit their data. The what, are you going, what, what is your the initiative, what, what is its data bank, and how is that going to be different from other data banks? So quite a few people have acquired data. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's data at Columbia, there's data here, there's data there. W what is going to distinguish yours? And should all of these be uh, melded together, or is that not possible? Yeah, so let me, let me address the first question first. I think the, probably the thing that differentiates our um, registry, which we're calling you plus me, because um, we want to encourage people to also bring a healthy volunteer along with them as part of the, the sample mm -hmm. donation. Um, 
the thing that differentiates it is right from the get-go it, it seemed important to me that we incorporate longitudinal data capture and ongoing data capture mm -hmm. so digital health right is, is is really impacting the way that we understand diseases so we're working on designing out um, a symptom capture app so um, That's very interesting. we want to capture data not just at a single time point H how will but this on an ongoing work? basis so people viewing this can how will the app work so so how the registry will work is you'll you'll go onto your computer and you'll complete some sort of baseline information um, demographics medical history some baseline surveys then you'll get a link to download the app and then the app will allow you to enter symptom data we're asking people to do it every three days but you can change the frequency to more frequent less frequent depending on your preference um, we're collecting data on five core symptoms those five core symptoms were selected based on some surveying we did among the patient population to say what are really the five that you'd like to track on a, on a more frequent basis. What, what are the symptoms or some of them? On refreshing sleep, fatigue, orthostatic intolerance. That's all right, you don't have to remember <laughs> them. Uh, I, I, <laughs> I'm sure you know them very well. Uh, and people will report on the, the degree so people, of... So people will report on, on the degree of severity of those five symptoms. Mm -hmm. And then we're also capturing things like um, number of hours of feet on the ground, general wellness, mm -hmm. um, step counts, things like that. So they'll complete this in the information in the app. They'll also have the option to record whatever else they want in there. So we wanted a standardized component that you could look from patient to patient and see see what the symptoms were but we also wanted the flexibility that we could say oh that's interesting we now have this subset of patients who report frequently on whatever symptom it is and they look like they belong to a cluster that all have a similar uh, demo you know demography and disease history and just as a reporter interviewing patients mm -hmm. there are some commonalities one is this extraordinary thing that they mostly they remember the day they got sick, mm -hmm. which is very unusual. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it really is. Yeah. Um, they often they were athletic, but not always. Mm -hmm. um, and after that, he had flu-like symptoms. Mm -hmm. Expectation that this will be over in a few days. Yep. Tremendous difficulty in finding a physician. Yep. More difficulty in getting a diagnosis. Uh, but these things are fairly common. But the, the early ones, the remembering, which is just fascinating. Yeah, it is uh, fascinating. Uh, exercise, the role there. A lot of people I've interviewed, this is not a scientific survey, it's simply people that I've talked to, uh, had this post exertion yeah. in onset. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, then they seem to have, it seems to go like this. Some have like two terrible years when they're bedridden and somewhat better mm -hmm. and always trading off activity for uh, collapse. Yeah. yeah. If they want to go to the theater tonight and have dinner with friends, that's three days in bed. Yeah. It's almost like there's a price list yeah. uh, of the horrors that will follow. I think, I think that's one of the most devastating pieces of it. And I also think, Another awful thing that patients are living with is this, if they do get better, the fear that it's gonna come back again. And so how much do you continue to, to push yourself? You don't wanna get back to being bedridden and, and sort of living in that um, envelope, it just seems like it's awful. My, my way of trying to describe this is that you're under glass. Yeah. Your life has been confiscated but in plain sight. Yeah. You're here, you're doing things, people around you are having a normal, natural life, yeah. and you seem to be part of it, except you, know. you can't. You're yeah. not. You won't be able to do it tomorrow if you're doing it tonight. Um, yeah. You know, just a small social activity, which is, is very shattering and very difficult. Yeah, and you sort of become invisible, right? You just kind of, you go away and, yeah. I and it's also, you know, it, it puts a terrible stress on compassion. Yeah. Because you've got to be compassionate with somebody that you're close to for decades. Yeah. You know, whereas everybody is compassionate for a little bit. Yes. You know, but after a while I think it gets very hard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think that I've had a lot of emails from patients who say that, you know, I can't blame my wife for leaving or I can't blame my husband for uh, uh, and others who are very grateful to people who devoted their lives to caring for them. 
and, yeah. and of course those who have no one and yeah. endure all this on their own. Uh, do you have in your mind, as, as a professional, any idea when some sort of breakthrough would come? Do you, do you, do you sort of uh, think... I think it's impossible to I say, I found right? in, in a lot of scientific things, and this is very unsigned, 40 years is a, is a chunk a of time <laughs> at the end of which you sometimes get somewhere. Uh, I, I just wondered if you had in mind any time frame that you thought yeah and it's so it's dependent on so many things right if you i know hiv is often looked at as an analog but if you if you're going to pump the kind of money that got pumped into hiv research and the kind of interest from the pharmaceutical industry you're going to accelerate you know discovery cures treatments so i think there's so many variables that are mixed into that that it's really difficult to predict um ha what would be a good research effort you've seen other research mm -hmm. efforts do you think that 200 scientists working with plenty of funding, or 100 scientists, or uh, in, a, in an ideal world, what sort of effort would you like to see? A giant effort <laughs> is what I'd like to see. I mean, I, I clearly, currently it's underfunded, right? The underfunding results in not very many people stay coming into the field or staying in the field because it's just it's difficult to keep going when it's difficult to get money and when you don't know if you're going to be doing it five years out because yes. there may be no money this exactly. is one of the big disturbances in all scientific research mm -hmm. is when the money stops the research stops mm -hmm. and it's not resumed axiomatically in two years when yeah, exactly. more money arrives so uh, i think i mean nih have, have made some strides right i think the the dollars that they put towards the crcs that's, a, that's great right and and the collaboration that the crcs that model i think will really uh, help uh, define clc crcs and um, the collaborative research centers right you know i think that that to me especially all the time i think this is true but especially in this field we need to be breaking down silos sharing data sharing methods sharing positive negative findings sharing samples sharing absolutely everything and we just can. just information i i'm interested in little things that help patients yeah not huge things little right. things right the love of a dog right maybe a particular skin i've i've encountered all these so i'm not making them up right uh, dogs are very important you can't have a dog if you're living on your own and you're sick cats are very important of course there's a marvelous book about a woman who studied a snail because hmm. she was so sick she had nothing uh, and learned a great deal and uh, uh, tova's her name uh, i can't quite remember the the, the name of the book, I think it's The Sound of a Wild Snail Eating or something like that. Right. But it's a great little book. Uh, and she was in such terror, but she came very attached to the snail that somebody had given her in, in a glass thing. And every day she couldn't move very far, so she lay there and watched the snail mm -hmm. going through its, its life. I think someone to love, even if it's a snail, right? We know has a big impact on your well-being and then that has an impact on your immune oh, system and reduces inflammation absolutely i'm so glad you said that um someone to love you mm -hmm. know i know one patient who sleeps with two dogs and they're terribly important mm -hmm. to her critical i mean it's critical and i think you know there is scientific evidence that shows that having someone to love or having a pet um can, really can we would your database have a sort of sidebar which had little things that help. So we will, as part of the app and the baseline data collection, we will be collecting things like, have you had certain drugs that have helped? We haven't taken it as far as, are there little things that help? such as you know i find and it's very I, different some people are sound really intolerant some mm -hmm. people are light intolerant or sound and light intolerant and that passes or mm -hmm. it doesn't pass um, there, there's no standard state no there isn't but i think what the app will allow us to do it, it, it will be kind of like a diary and a journal for people where they'll be able to capture some of that information which is specific to them um, and so I, I do think we'll start to see, based on, based on those, that data entry, we'll start to see the kinds of things that are having an impact. Sadie, we want to put a slate up on the screen of how to reach you, okay. uh, etc. What is that? Um, so you can email me at swhitaker at solvecfs.org. Um, or you can email research 
at solvecfs.org. And the, 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 to go to the Solve uh, web page. Mm -hmm. We actually have a, a place to pre-register for the registry and buy a bank, and we have over a thousand patients already pre-registered. Well, that's very important. Mm -hmm. We'll put that so up we can on the put screen. That up on the screen too. That's great, Sadie. It's a pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet and, you too. And very encouraging to talk to you. Thank yeah, you thank so you. much. Okay. Cheers. Thanks.